Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for blade lovers to learn about knives and hear from the makers, manufacturers, and reviewers that make the knife world go round. I'm Bob DeMarco, and coming up, a new med tech from Dervish Knives, uh, Tim Kell's t -Kell Knives Guardian, and my collection of cold steel fixed blade knives. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome back to the show. Uh, my favorite comment from this past week, and there were many and I liked them all, but this one rang true. Uh, this is from WC Reviews, a new channel on YouTube. I see folks who are not looking to pay. Oh, this, by the way, this was on the video I did on the Jake Hoback Summit, a really cool knife, uh, one of Jake Hoback's made in China. He says, I see folks who are not going, who are not looking to pay the price for this because it's made in China. No judgment as the price is high, but if the quality is there, which I believe it is, worth is what people are willing to pay. Riyadh, Liang Ma, et cetera, et cetera. They all charge premium prices. The USA Med Medfords are now like $700 to $1,200. Now that said, $625 is a lot for any knife, but you wheel and you deal and you wait. I just bought one for $525, brand new from the Knife Center. Great video. Wow, you like big bruisers just like me. I've liked and subbed. Check out WC Reviews. Well, do check out WC Reviews if you're here. You probably like the big bruiser knives as well, and uh, he covers those. So, so do check him out. What I like about this comment is the relative nature of worth. Um, when I was in college, everything's relative, man. Uh, that was the refrain, and I don't believe that anymore. Not everything is relative, but price is, especially in a time of high inflation. Uh, we're not made of money, and so if you're if you're so compelled by a knife that you're willing to pay 625 bucks for it, that is the value of it, period. Um, I, I guess I have not much more to say about that. Maybe that's uh, my own justification for some of the knives I have. But uh, you know that that old saying, beauty is in the eye of the beholder? Well, in this case, worth is in the wallet of the beholder. So, well, take that or leave it as you will. All right, I think uh, all that depth being dredged up, it's time for a pocket check. Today in my front right pocket, in the main position, I had this beauty. Uh, this is the Manix 2 Lightweight with the S110V steel. This was a gift to me from... Uh, edgy American Shane Gables, uh, very generous gift. I really appreciate it. I love this knife. Uh, this has begun a re-interest, a resurgence of interest for me in the brand, in Spyderco. I have a pretty hefty collection. I have about 15 Spydercos, and I haven't carried much of them, most of them in a while, um, but I'm back into them, and this knife really did it. That S110V is Pretty amazing steel, I hear. I haven't pushed it anywhere near its limits, uh, but it came with a wicked edge that uh, Shane put on there. And uh, I just love carrying and using this knife. Often, and when not uh, being used uh, um, in my front right pocket. All right, so that was front right today. Uh, next up, I carried, uh, changed it up a bit. I've been carrying Jack Wolf knives uh, pretty much every single day and i decided to check out some of my other knives uh in the slip joint drawer uh this is the gun stock from fox knives and this is the uh, collector uh collector knives edition mike latham of collector knives designed this and had it produced for uh, by fox knives italy such a beautiful knife crown spine uh it's got uh, M390 blade steel. We know that M390 is a premium steel. And, uh, you know, I love that. It's got great action. Not as stiff. Here, I'm going to do that right in front of the mic so you can hear. But that walk and talk is not as stiff as uh, or stout as the um, Jack Wolf knives are. So it's, it's interesting to, after carrying the Jack Wolf knives for so long uh, on such a regular basis, it's, it's cool to have this in the pocket and just feel the difference. Uh, nice and small, this knife is. 
Uh, I don't carry this in a slip, though I have one just uh, for it. it. The slip itself doesn't really stop this from turning uh, north to or east to west in my pocket, so I don't generally use it. It just kind of bangs around in the pocket. That being said, I keep those pockets free of other things because I don't want uh, I don't want them to get unnecessarily dinged and 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 danged up. Uh, next. The TKL Knives Guardian. Now you were probably uh, you probably seen the podcast or listened to the podcast I did with Mr. Tim Kell. Uh, that's up this week, and I've been just grooving on this knife a lot, uh, carrying this Scout style up front. Uh, it's small enough that handle is short enough, and um, uh, it it's balanced perfectly to ride horizontal horizontally without listing handle wise. Um, I did have this with the guardian, uh, no, not the guardian, I'm sorry, the Sentry handle. That's the aftermarket handle he sells that includes a karambit style ring and it lengthens the handle in a nice way, uh, but it does throw off the balance a little for me. And uh, the only way I can carry this scout style up front, uh, I do not live in a place where people look kindly upon, you know, open carry of fixed blade knives. Uh, but with a sweater or, you know, at work, it's so cold. I, I always have a little jacket on. So this covers that up perfectly. Triple edged for maximum damage. And that really short grind makes this uh, a really nasty puncturing uh, implement because of the giant hole it leaves. Uh, I love this with the purple and black scales. That's his uh, Black Hawk um, handle material. And he's got a bunch of different um, handle materials you can get. Go to the website, go to TKL Knives and check out all the really cool knives and then all the great ways you can have them set up. And then get yourself one. You'll be glad you did. Uh, lastly, on me for emotional support today, I had the, the Behigh. The Best Tech Behigh. This is just dropping now. And I put the video up on Friday. And... I am not this organized. I put it up on the day that Best Tech asked me to. This was sent to me by Best Tech. And one of the caveats was, please post your um, video on such and such a date. Well, and I did, uh, but that was only incidentally. <laughs> and then I looked and everyone else who received one of these from Best Tech uh, put their video up on the same day. So it was a flood of Baha'i videos. But that's not bad because this thing is awesome. I love this knife. I think I showed it off last week in the state of the collection. Fits exactly in the palm without any, without showing anything at all. And then you just use that top flipper and here it comes. Great little utility knife. I've used it a lot. Uh, opening up food packages, opening up boxes um, and letters. Yes, I still receive letters. Mostly they're in bill form, uh, but this works great for unzipping an envelope. And I bet it would work great for unzipping lots of things. Uh, very small, fits in the hand really easily. This reminds me of uh, sort of the straight version of the Strelit. You know, the Strelit, also designed by Ostop Hell in his bouquet series. Strelit kind of looks like this. It's a curved, downward curved blade uh, that protrudes from between your fingers when you flip it open. I really would like to get one of those. But, you know, I say that all the time on the show. I want, I want, I need to get and all that. Um, got to keep that, got to keep that tempered a little bit. But uh, so this is what I was carrying on me today. A nice colorful grouping. I got to say not one bit of black G10 here. Uh, the Mannix 2 lightweight from Spyderco. The Fox Knives uh, Collector Knives Edition Gunstock. The Guardian by TKL Knives and the Behai by Best Tech Knives. Beautiful, beautiful knives, all uh, in a range of prices. And uh, that's what we're about here at the Knife Junkie channel. Uh, you get you get knives that are six bucks from uh, from from Walmart all the way up to knives that are six hundred dollars from from Hinderer knives and, and beyond. So uh, that's that's what I like. I like a wide, wide range. A um, couple more days left for you to, to bag one of these. Here it is, the Nova One, my pride and joy. Uh, 
my material pride and joy. My children are my pride and joy. But uh, in terms of material goods, I love this thing. This is the knife collaboration I did with Hogtooth Knives. Uh, there are uh, two more days. You have until the 31st, uh, midnight on the 31st to, uh, of March to get this knife. Now, there are, this is a uh, EDC Bowie knife. That's what I'm calling it. You got that nice recurve that you can sharpen through over time. You will always have a beautiful profile on this knife, no matter how much you use it, how much you sharpen it. Uh, there are going to be some changes from this prototype. That logo will be much smaller and featured on the flat of the blade. The handle will be this maroon linen micarta, one of my favorite, very favorite materials, polished, but with those grooves, man, it locks in hand, especially with that choil too and the overall profile. Uh, 154 CM blade steel acid stone washed. Uh, the liners will be uh, deep green. That row of jimping will be moved forward for positive thumb engagement, and they will be numbered. Uh, at, this, uh, at this juncture, it'll be a number out of 20. So, uh, But there's still a chance for it to, to go up to 50. If 30 people order in the next two days, uh, we'll max out at 50. So there it is. It comes in an amazing sheath. Uh, really, Matt Chase does great sheaths that push thumb push off. It, it has very positive engagement in there, and it ships with the uh, discrete carry concepts clip, my favorite clip. And I was just waxing poetic with Matt uh, last Friday about about those. He's going to try and get me in touch with the guy who started that company, who's just man, he has he has achieved incredible success with just a with just a clip. Um, it's not just for knives; uh, people use them on their holsters for guns too. Uh, be sure to check out the Nova One pre-order. Uh, this is a chance to be a part of history. Uh, and I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, next up, I want to show you something uh, that I I started talking about a little while ago when I got this. Uh, but this past weekend, I just began the project. So this is my Rough Rider Black Mule Bowie, the best 25 bucks you can spend in knives, period. Uh, I'm not the only one who thinks this. This is like 3CR, and you think 3CR is going to be terrible. They got their heat treat so nailed down. I abused, I actually abused this knife. Uh, not just hard used it. I did stuff that you probably shouldn't do with knives, and it's incredible. It remained incredibly sharp, never a ding or chip in the edge, and I was just incredibly impressed by this. And I am not the only one. You can check out a number of videos, people doing the same things and being equally shocked at how the Rough Rider 3CR uh, performs. The only thing about this is that handle. Wah, wah, wah. It's this rubber handle and it's very comfortable, um, but I had it on good, uh, good word that it's full tang. Well, I found that out because I took, took the handle off. And the reason I did that is, is uh, through the use and abuse, one of the... Um, one of the brass rings holding it in, brass tubes holding it in, became dislodged. So I figured this was the time to reveal the tang just to show the world, uh, the wider world, that yes, it is full tang, but I'm going to turn this into a project knife. This looks like the knife that Aldo Rain in uh, Inglorious Bastards had on him. And uh, so I'm going to find a piece of stag. I've, I was looking on Jance and also a piece of brass. I'm going to. Uh, take up the remove about this much of the of the of the tang there so that I can get a guard to fit up a little bit closer to the blade. I'm going to cut off this end part probably and I'm going to make this into a really cool stag handled bowie. Stag or maybe wood, you know, I don't know, I don't know if I'm sh flying too close to the sun with the stag. Uh, I don't want to spend, you know, 50 bucks on a piece of sandbar uh stag and then um and then have it have me not know what the hell i'm doing plus i don't know if this tang is too wide uh for the for the stag handles i can find so i gotta look into it a little more all i know is i'm gonna turn this into something sweet and then i'm gonna have my brother make a leather sheath for it he doesn't know that yet and uh this will be my my project knife and i gotta say in the process i will probably uh cover up or remove uh the the rough rider logo and and the china logo but I will always know 
And I will always give it credit. At least I will always give Rough Rider credit for making this awesome blade. It's shocking how good this blade is, uh, especially for 25 bucks, man. 25 bucks. Uh, I highly recommend it if you're interested in Bowies but don't have one and you're not uh, psyched about spending a, a whole bunch of money to get one. This is one to get. All right, setting this aside gingerly because I don't have the sheath close by, I will set it down there. Now, we're going to do something a little bit new on the midweek supplemental, uh, this Wednesday show, and uh, I want you all to be a part of it. I have some knives to give away, and we're going to give some away right here on the channel, uh, right here on the midweek supplemental. And uh, all you're going to have to do is subscribe and comment on this video uh, by the Saturday following this video, midnight. In this case, it'll be April 1st, 2023 at midnight. All you got to do is subscribe. You may as well like while you're there and comment and you stand to win this knife. This is the Miguron Acri, a, a very beautiful, somewhat hard use, I would say, due to the stoutness, uh, gentleman's folder. I'm calling it a gentleman's folder because it's so classy looking. Uh, I'm terrible with front flipping with my right hand, so I'll just do it, or with my left hand, so I'll just do it with my right. Uh, all black here with these nice gold liners. Uh, when Civivi came out, first came out with the Praxis and a couple of others, and I had the, the gold liners with the blue handles and all that, I thought it was tacky and ugly. But in this case, man, I really do like the way uh, the gold liners look on this. Just a little touch of class. Uh, but that is a nicely sized uh, 3.75 inch blade, a very nice contour G10 handle. And then you've got that front flipper there. So all you got to do, if you want this knife to be yours for absolutely nothing, all you got to do is comment below in this video, subscribe. And then I also suggest you like. If you're already a subscriber, well, then you don't have to worry about the subscribe part. Um, but yeah, be sure to like too. Why not? Why not like the show? It's a it's a very likable show. Uh, so yeah, this could be yours. This is the Miguron Acri. And next week at this time, we will do a uh, a giveaway. And we will choose it using a random uh, number generator that Jim has conjured up. All right. So that is that. Still to come on the Knife Junkie podcast, we're going to take a look at some Knife Life news. We're going to look at Dervish. That's a company that... Uh, uh, whose earlier knives just really hooked me. And uh, and then we'll get to the state of the collection. All right here on the Knife Junkie podcast. If you're a knife junkie, you're always in the market for a new knife. And we've got you covered. For the latest weekly knife deals, be sure to visit the knifejunkie.com slash knives. Through our special affiliate relationships, we bring you weekly knife specials on your favorite knives. Help support the show and save money on a new knife. Shop at thenifejunkie.com slash knives. That's thenifejunkie.com slash knives. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. You might remember episode 108. That was some 300 episodes ago. Uh, I had on John Gonzalez of Dervish Knives. Uh, John started off as a custom maker. Well, he's still a custom maker, but he went heavy into the mid-tech uh, way of producing knives uh, to bolster his custom uh, knife career, as, as many have. And he's kind of stuck with it. And recently, uh, he just, well, I should say, he just released this good looking knife this is the the prima fix blade it's a hunting utility knife and he designed this on the suggestion of one of his big fans um this is not a design given to him by a fan but the idea uh this one of his collectors said why have you not made a hunting knife yet and he thought i don't know so he put his beautiful design sense uh to the task and came up with this Prima. And like all of John Gonzalez's knives and his mid-tech runs, he he does one run. In this case, it'll be a 250-piece run, and then maybe 10 years later, he comes back to it. Actually, he's coming back to his uh, Navajo model after 10 years, uh, coming up uh, here soon, uh, which he also licensed to BRS, 
uh, recently. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's 2.75 inches of, uh, of blade there, full tang, nitro V, uh, somewhat um, mid-tier steel. And it's going to come with these uh, three colors of G10, that purple, that dark kind of uh, coyote, orange, and then that beautiful camo carbon. Uh, camo carbon is a, uh, a USA made um, carbon company, carbon fiber company uh, that we've seen a lot on Jack Wolf knives recently and other places. Just a beautiful beautiful stuff. But he's going to be using his same uh, OEM that he's been using for quite some time, all made in the United States. Everything made in the United States. I love hearing that. All right, so that is the Dervish Knives um, Prima by John Gonzalez. Next up, this one is very cool, and I believe we talked about this when this was just a sparkle in the eye of Leo Espinoza. Leo Espinoza of Topps Knives. Uh, Topps is coming out with uh, something they call the Papa Delta. It's a ring uh, defensive knife that solves the ring problem. What's the ring problem, you say, Bob? Well, the ring problem is on karambits and other ring style knives, um, you want that ring there for retention, but uh, it's a thin line between retention and just being trapped. And you don't want a knife trapped on your finger, uh, possibly breaking your finger in a real uh, tussle. So uh, with the help of an undercover police officer slash uh, former intelligence officer, they came up with this, that open ring concept. So the ring is there, and it, it does lock you in, but if it needs to come out of your hand, it can. And not just the old fashioned way, it'll just pop off. And uh, I think this is a really cool compromise because I, I'm compelled by ring style um, daggers and ring style karambits, uh, but was, I don't know, kind of made a little shy of them when I spoke to Ed Calderon and he talked about in his uh in his organic medium test where they stab pigs with knives, how much uh, the ring can really jack up your finger if you're not careful or, or if the thing that you're stabbing is moving around a lot. So like I said, this solves that problem and uh, it has a nice little uh, 1095. This is all 1095, but that blade is 1.63 inches. So very small double-edged fullered blade uh, in, in a midnight bronze, um, coding. That's 1095, if I didn't say so. Uh, also, the whole point of this is super low profile. So that can be under your shirt in the in the uh, neck knife configuration or in your pocket. And just, you know, you're not going to see it. It's just so thin and so light and just so small. But, you know, 1.63 double-edged inches of 1095 breaching the skin is going to make someone reconsider their choices. And that's what this knife is all about. Uh, so very excited to see the, the Papa Delta now in production. Uh, next up from CJRB, a company that I like a lot. That's the, um, that's the um, mm, I'll say budget oriented line, uh, high value. That's what, that's what Nutton Fancy says. The high value line from Artisan uh, Knives, CJRB, they do a lot of great stuff. I, I find that the high value lines in these companies tend to do some interesting things because they're willing to take chances. Uh, it's like we and Civivi and Sencut. The, the Civivi and Sencut knives are more exciting than the Wii knives because uh, they're less expensive to produce. They can take chances. Anyway, CJRB has something very interesting coming out called the Cord. And uh, the prototype is just about to be uh, released uh, to the wider world for people to check out. Of course, that is a prototype, so changes will be made. But this thing, uh, with its 3.5-inch uh, clip point AR RPM9, that's their proprietary powder steel, uh, will be coming out in two distinct versions. This one with micarta, solid handle, flipper with a, um, what do you call that, button lock. But then they're also coming out with a skeletonized steel version of it. And that skeletonized steel version is also a button lock uh, up at the top of the page. And it's got, uh, instead of the flipper, it's got a, um, what do you call it? A choil. So interesting, uh, interesting, these two differences. It is a button lock, does have a loop over pocket clip. Uh, they both have thumb studs. I look at this and I got to say, 
Gerber paraframe comes to mind and I cannot stand that knife, even though I have one of them. It was a gift and I'm not getting rid of it. But the, the Gerber paraframe has probably made Gerber the most money over the past 20 years. But mm, I don't know. Sticks in my craw a little bit. But this is cool to see. I know coming from CJRB, it will be cool. It will work beautifully. Uh, it's on bearings. And uh, I love the look of that knife, which they call a drop point. I did. I, I promised myself I wouldn't say this, but I'm saying it. They call it a drop point. Look at it. How can you call that a drop point when it's so clearly a clip point? Uh, so that will be coming out soon uh, in prototype form uh, for the wider world to check out. Looking forward to that. Lastly, in Knife Life news, uh, news from Florida. Good news from Florida. Uh, the permitless carry bill. Uh, brought up by um, by knife rights uh, just passed their house. That's House Bill uh, 50, uh, 50, uh, 543, 543, House Bill HB 543. And uh, it passed the House 76 to 32. Wonder who those 32 members were. And then it heads to the Senate, where if it passes, Governor DeSantis, uh, who off the record I like very much, and not just because he's Italian, um, he has pledged to sign it. Uh, which is exciting. So this is thanks to Congressman Chuck Brannon and Senator, State Senator Jay Collins. Um, and what this does is it ensures that all weapons can be carried concealed, um, uh, including uh, firearms and all knives. That's what I meant, all knives, not all weapons, but all knives. So um, it's not just a pocket knife that you can drop in the bottom of your pocket. It is, uh, you know, all types of knives which opens things up. I, Florida. I like Florida. Uh, let me just read this real quick. This is a little bit from the Knife Rights webpage. It says, we thank primary sponsors, uh, Representative Chuck Brannon and Senator Jay Collins for ensuring that this bill covers all weapons, including knives. Thanks also to all of those who use Knife Rights Legislative Act Center to contact members to support this bill. Knife Rights supports constitutional and permitless carry, and particularly bills such as this that rid the state of its ban on concealed carry of knives other than pocket knives without a permit. Yes, yes. Thank you, Doug Ritter. Yet again, uh, that is the refrain, and I'm happy to sing it over and over again. Uh, speaking of Florida, and the house in Florida, this is just uh, something funny I heard in the news. Um, much like the Simpsons, uh, <laughs> a, uh, a uh, state house uh, congressman or representative had to read out some names in public comment. And, and uh, he sort of caught on while reading them. But one of them was uh, Anita Dick. She wanted to say something in public comment. And then after Anita, uh, Ms. Uh, Holden, uh, Holden Hiscock wanted to say something too. And, and they had to read that out loud. And I got to say, I cover a lot of meetings similar to this in my job. And man, I wish someone would do that. Uh, just to bring a little bit of levity. It's like uh, Bart, Bart Simpson calling the bar and saying, uh, I'm looking for Amanda. Amanda Hug and Kiss. Is Amanda Hug and Kiss there? And then, uh, you know. Mo, the bartender, has to yell out, I need Amanda. I need Amanda Hug and Kiss. Is Amanda Hug and Kiss there? I love that kind of humor. I, I don't need much, just uh, some physical humor and some of that kind of cheap, you know, 12th grade, tw I mean, 12-year-old uh, humor, and I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. All right, that's news from Florida, and that's Knife Life news. Still to come, we're going to check out two new knives in my State of the Collection and then my Cold Steel Fixed Blade Collection. The GetUpside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. GetUpside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. Speaking of CJRB, which we were just a moment ago, uh, CJRB sent me this knife. This is the Pyrite. They sent me this to check out. And uh, I've noticed that uh, since, well, just recently, people are reaching out to me. You want to check out these knives? And oftentimes I'll say yes. I said yes to CJRB because... Well, I have a couple of them and I dig their stuff. Plus, I wanted to see how this button lock 
would do. This is the Pyrite. That's a 3.25 inch AARPM9 -A -R -R 9 blade. Um, nearly full height flat grind, very thin, very slicey, uh, really great blade um, on a very nice handle with excellent button lock action. As a matter of fact, uh, it, this came up on Thursday Night Knives this past week, and it, it is my favorite of the button locks that I have um, for the button lock itself. Now, I like my Mad Tonto from Kaiser as a knife better uh, because it's a big burly Tonto and it's a little bit more um, my style, but this has really an excellent button lock. Um, the knife itself is very light. This is G10 with super skeletonized uh, handle scales and um, and it comes in G10, a couple of flavors of G10, and then a stainless steel version, which uh, looks really great too. Now, the thing I like about the, the button lock here is that it the button itself sits proud of the handle, but not too far proud and is easy to, to actuate. I find like the, the uh, Civivi Watuga or Watuaga, as I like to call it, is difficult to deal with because it has a convex surface and, or I'm sorry, a concave surface. And you have to really push it like really deep into the handle to make it uh, go in. And then once it goes in, it slaps against the, the frame and pops back out because you've overcommitted with the pushing in of the button. And unless you time it perfectly, it's not going to stay in that handle. It's going to bounce back out. Uh, this one solves that problem, A, with the, with the button and how the button is designed. But also, it instead of having a conical shape that the plunge, that that button plunge lock goes into this one has a very distinct i'm going to try and get this to focus has very distinct notches cut into the tang there you go you see that it's a perfectly sharp little cutout cup half cup that goes about halfway across the tang that the um button lock plunger nestles into most button lock knives just have a a conical groove cut out. And the idea is that, that the wide part of that button plunger seats in that groove. And then over time, as that plunger wears down, it'll seat deeper and deeper and deeper. Well, I like it conceptually. That's a good idea. That's kind of a Demco uh, way of approaching it. You know, as it wears in, it gets it, it, the lock up becomes deeper and more um, solid, but uh, those things are failing. On the button lock, those button locks are failing a lot. This one, I have spine whacked. Sorry, Jim, for the audio. But I've spine whacked this and harder than that with gloves on. And it's not going anywhere uh, for me. Now, when I talked about this on Thursday Night Knives, I had a lot of people talking about, uh, about their button locks failing. This one has not failed me yet. And I am not worried about it because generally when I'm using a knife, I'm not using it like this. I'm usually using it with the edge forward and edge down. Uh, and I'm almost never hammering with the spine of my knife, almost never, uh, because they have a tool for that uh, sort of hammering action. And, and it's called a hammer and you can get them for way less than you can a nice folding knife. So I recommend a hammer for any sort of hammering tasks and a, a button lock, especially the CJRB Pyrite, which has become my favorite button lock out of the five that I have, um, uh, minus the Scorpio, because the Scorpio, that's a special knife. Uh, this thing is awesome. I do recommend this Pyrite, and I believe it's out. I think it's, it's out for general uh, consumption. So highly recommend it. Do like the Pyrite. I would check out the steel version if I, if I had had the choice. Okay, next up, uh, I just wanted to show the, oh, where is it? Where is it? Here it is. Man, look at this. This is new from Off Grid Knives. This is the Off Grid Knives Viper version two. Uh, great thing about Off Grid Knives, designed by Kerry Orifice out in California and produced by Best Tech or an awesome uh, Taiwanese uh, OEM. He, he has them built in two different factories is that he's always listening to the customer and always doing 
uh, quality control updates. And it was time for the Viper to get a quality control update. And he changed quite a number of things. Uh, the handle here is nicely contoured with these big chamfers. We saw that kind of in the Stinger XL. Um, that the chamfers here on the side really give it the feeling of being contoured. You can see some blue staining there. I wore this in a new pair of blue jeans, carried this in a new pair of blue jeans and uh, sort of rubbed off on there. Um, but also really great knurling on the, on the flat part of the handle. So the, the broad chamfers give it that feeling of being contoured without rounding it off. Uh, gave it the three screw uh, inset with the flat screw loop over pocket clip. Awesome. And on the off side, as all people, as all companies who are milling pockets for their clips to sit in, he put a pocket filler uh, tab there. So I like that quite a bit. Um, this jimping is really cool because you get this sort of traditional file work jimping on the side and then Boom, jimping on the top when you turn it this way. So it's like double jimped. And uh, who doesn't like double jimping? And if you say you don't, you're lying. Um, sorry, that just came out. Uh, but that uh, Tonto tip is a clip point. I'm call it, calling it a clip point Tonto because it's clipped right here and it puts that tip in the center line. So you're still getting that full thickness for uh, penetration that you come to expect in a westernized tanto but the tip is down in the center line uh, which gives you great uh, um, uh, indexing so you always know where that tip is going to be as opposed to a say a cold steel style tanto which i love but that tip is up at the top at the spine and um, you know it doesn't really reduce its penetrative power but it does reduce your ability to index it i believe so having that tip center line, I think, is a, a great idea. I must admit, I, I'm not as crazy about how it looks with the tip center line, but I really like how it functions. And so, um, you know, I'm going to have to ditch my shallowness for a moment and, and go with function over form in this case and say uh, really, really great uh, improvements on, on the westernized Tonto and then on this knife in particular, he's made a lot of great changes. 154 uh, CM blade steel, 154 crucible, he says here on the blade. So um, crucible steel, 154 ingot steel from crucible. Really, really nice. Um, you know me, off-grid knives, I love them. We also have an affiliate link. So if you like this knife, uh, buy it through the knifejunkie.com slash off grid. That way we get a little bit from that sale, a very small percentage from that sale, but it everything adds up, you know, everything helps. So uh, you can help support us that way. All right, let's take a look at the state of the, uh, at the cold steel fixed blade um, collection. Now I did this because I need to catalog, you know, my ever growing um, collection of cold steel knives. And this is a great place to do it. And this, I want to say there is one caveat, as always, uh, to the, the collection portion here. And that caveat is this does not include neck knives. I have about uh, five neck knives, um, but I've covered them in other places, uh, primarily the neck knife uh, episode. So I'm not going to do those here. This is all of my big fixed blade knives from them. First up is the classic. This is the one that started it all way back in the late 80s. For me, anyway, this is the Master Tonto. This one was actually, well, this was made in Japan. As you can see there from the from the uh, courier font. I love that. Made in Japan, designed in um, California. You got the brass fittings, which they haven't used in ages. And they're nicely tarnished. This handle here is uh, 30 years old and still um, it's not... You know, this is this is a true long term review. It's not tacky. It's not coming. Uh, it's it's tacky enough to hold for grip, but it's not coming apart. You know how rubber over time kind of comes apart. Well, this handle is still uh, pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, I see. I see that. I see the scratch in the hollow grind. Uh, I attempted to make a 
Kydex sheath for this years ago, and I didn't know anything about Kydex and how it can scratch up a blade if you're not super careful, and I wasn't super careful. Uh, so here it is, the Master Tonto, the one that started it all. And I've been thinking of getting a new one, uh, but why? I don't need to. Um, classic leather sheath. I wish I could find a replacement classic leather sheath for this uh, with a snap. But lo and behold, uh, this, this is the thing. And so it will stay that way. Next up, the knife I had in my bag when I was running around New York City on 9-11. Uh, of course, I didn't use it for anything, but I will always remember it as that. Uh, this is the Culloden, uh, a um, large skin do uh, style knife, you know, the, the sock knife that the Scottish uh, kilt wearers <laughs> have in their, in their, um, in their socks. This one is cool because it, the handle cants out like that, which makes it easier to uh, grasp when you're um, pulling it out, especially if it's close to the skin. If you're using this as a boot knife, as it's set up, or if you're carrying it in the waistband, as I like to carry it, that little bit of uh, angle out at the pommel really helps in removing it. Now, look at that classic style file work jimping. That's what I was getting at with the uh, Viper 2 from Off Grid. It's sort of a tip of the hat to that style of jimping, uh, but I really like it. It feels really good in hand. Uh, feels great on that thumb, and it does the work of the regular kind of jimping that we know, you know, the modern jimping. But I love that. I wish they did more of this kind of stuff on cold steel knives. It's a great five inch blade, great for penetrating. And uh, this has seen a lot of use over the years. I've had this for uh, a bunch of years, at least 20, at least 20 years. I know that or 21 years. All right. So there it is a great sheath. And also this sheath protects uh, the, the flesh, whatever you're going to have this against uh, because it rises up higher on that side, on the non clip side. So if you're wearing, if you're carrying this in your waistband and you have it right up against your love handle, your love handle is safe. As you remove this, you have a little bit of extra sheath there to guard. And then also when you're, when you're resheathing. Next up, my one and only push dagger. This is sad. I need another push dagger in my life. Uh, but until I get there, this safe keeper too will do the trick. This is one of their first these last two knives, one of their first uh, Securex sheaths. I like it because it's flat on that side, and then you have all the shaping on that side, so it does rest nicely against the body uh, if you're carrying it in the waistband. Uh, this does have the classic style handle here. That, um, there we go. Uh, this is how it's supposed to be in the hand, like this, or you could carry it like, you could use it like this. Uh, but in this case, it's a symmetrical handle, T-shaped handle. So uh, protruding between your ring finger and your swear word finger is the best. I think that's a three and a half inch blade, double edged, just wicked, wicked, uh, very hard to disarm, uh, great for slashing as well as thrusting. We forget uh, with, with these push daggers, which are so obviously set up for a punching, thrusting motion, that they're also great for slashing. Just look at the strelet uh, that I was talking about before. Uh, by Best Tech. It's a downward hooking blade. Uh, you can thrust with that and you can uh, swipe and tear with it. So um, I, I'm a big fan of the format. Um, I think these come from the classic Indian uh, gauntlet knives. Um, so uh, you could see this if it had a pearlescent handle. You could see this in the cummerbund of a riverboat gambler right next to his, uh, his cult peacemaker. Uh, I, I do love these and they are very, very user friendly, much like the um, S shaped blades that you see in the civilian and the Talon II, and uh, much like the Pakal style knives, they don't take a lot of training to use to great effect. Next up, this is probably uh, unofficially, I'll say, probably the most money making knife for cold steel because uh, it's been around forever. Uh, this is the Coban, and it is a thin and economical version of the Tonto uh, that I was showing you before. You got your Securex sheath. I, I have an aftermarket clip on it. And uh, this is Aus 8 hollow ground, thin, slicey blade with that uh, nice flat ground tip. A very, very 
uh, effective knife. I got my sister one of these when she had some creepy dude hanging around and uh, she kept it by the bed, made her feel good. Um, that was years and years ago and they, they're still making it nice and thin. That's, that's the real benefit of this. You got that Coke bottle handle, but it's still nice and thin. Carries great in the waistband. And um, this is one of my at-home, primary at-home fixed blades. Because uh, you can put it in sweatpants. You can wear it in pajama bottoms. It's so nice and light. It's it's not going to hassle you, but you have a knife on you at all, uh, at all times. And I got to say, I am a real subscriber to that never unarmed philosophy that I first learned from Lynn Thompson. Uh, there's no reason to not be armed, even when you're in your home. People people come into your home uninvited sometimes. So, um, yeah. And there are other things to vanquish them with. But, hey, man, if you're in a tussle and you're, and you're surprised, this is a great thing to have on you. If you can't get to the 870 quick enough. All right. Next up is the Peacekeeper 2. These names, man, I have to have them written down because... Some of the cold steel names, Peacekeeper, Safekeeper, one, two, you know. Uh, but this is a line of daggers that were discontinued quite a while ago. This is the Peacekeeper 2. There's the Peacekeeper 1, which is a larger blade. Uh, I got this one on eBay uh, in a recent uh, recent purchase, I guess within the last year. Um, man, not much to say about this, except that it fits the classic. Oh, my gosh, I'm missing one. I'm missing one. Oh, my God. This is reminding me of the Taipan, which is over. Damn, I'm going to have to do another one of these updates. It's in my case. Ah. All right. Well, if you know about the profiles of the cold steel daggers, first started with the Taipan, <clears throat> which I'm not going to be showing you, unfortunately. They have hollow, quad hollow ground blades with um, bellied edges. That's what I love. They start. Uh, at a, they taper outwards towards the tip, and then they come to a very stout tip. So you're not worried about this in a thrust like you might on some daggers, uh, but you have the belly for excellent slashing capability. This is how I think daggers should be done because, yes, you can still thrust with great effect with this, but the the edge with the belly bellying out towards the tip just gives you incredible uh, slashing and swiping power. Um, I, I think that that's an important aspect of a knife. You don't want to, you don't want to do everything just in deference to the stabbing ability. Uh, so I love this peacekeeper too. And I, I love my Taipan. Actually, I waited like 25 years to get it and I finally got it. I'm shocked. I didn't remember to put it in this, um, in this list. Uh, the reason I didn't, I think, is because I keep it with in, in the same drawer with my custom fixed blades. That's how much I love that knife. Oh, well. Well, you can look at my other videos on that knife. Okay, next up. This one is the SRK. And this SRK, uh, this lived in a um, uh, um, survival bag that I made my wife before we were wed. And she moved to London for a year to open up. Uh, the London office of the company she was working for at the time. And uh, I knew that in, in Europe, in England, if, if it ever hit the fan, she, she wouldn't be able to go out and get one of these. So I packed up a, uh, a bag for her and shipped it over a big survival bag backpack. And this was the knife in there. And uh, it has somehow worked its way into my collection uh, over the past 15 years at slowly but surely made it into the collection here. Uh, we still have our, our escape bags, uh, but it's a little less urgent that they're fully stocked as we have a house. At the time, we were living in Manhattan, and, uh, you know, there's there's not much time. If, if you have to leave the apartment and try and figure out how to fashion a, a raft to get yourself over one of the rivers to safety, um, you, you don't want to have to think about where's my SRK. So this knife is... Uh, basically unused for all that time this is the carbon v steel uh, this one was i'm gonna i'm gonna show this up close so you believe me made in the usa look at that cold steel made in the usa so this was purchased in 2006 or late 2000 probably produced in 2005 
bought in 2006. Just a great universal all around clip point blade. I could see this on the kit of a soldier, Marine, um, or, or, you know, serviceman or woman because it is so stout and yet slicey. Uh, maybe I'm not going to call it slicey, but it's stout and sharp. And this is one of those knives that you could pry open a crate with, uh, open up MREs with, and then fight with because it's got that uh, zero ground clip here, um, which this never is discussed as a fighting knife. It's always a camping survival knife. But if you had to fight with this knife, it would be great because you have that guard stopping your fingers from sliding up on, on there. But it's a single quillion guard, so you can have your thumb for pressure cutting uh, on the back. And look at the look at the clip. As I turn it, you can see that the clip is zero ground. So it's not a cutting edge, uh, but just a slight flick of the wrist on the back of someone's hand, and you're going to do a lot of damage. Also, that sort of zero ground swedge makes the back part of the tip pretty nasty. Uh, we discovered this uh, in an old Kali class, in a Kali class I used to be in here in uh, where I live currently. Um, as you're, uh, if you're doing this here, let me go here. If you're, if you have someone trapped, have someone's arm trapped or some part of their body trapped between your arm and the back of the blade, as you release and you pull that tip, especially on a zero ground swedge, uh, really can gouge and do some, do some damage on the way out. And yeah, that's not a, um, fight ending, um, injury, but it's, a distractive injury. It's something that, oh, now I hurt there too. And by the way, what's this guy doing? You know, so uh, there's a lot that goes into, theoretically goes into uh, this kind of knife fighting. Now, uh, yeah, people don't get into knife duels much uh, anymore, but it's still a valuable um, self-perfection kind of martial art skill to have because you never know when one little tidbit of any of those self-perfection drills uh, will come out in a real fight. That's the whole idea. You know, you see people doing martial arts and you say, oh, well, that's not how a fight goes down. You'll never use that in the street. Well, that's not exactly the point. There are some things that you learn uh, because that's how it's going to go down in the street and you learn how to do it that way. And then there are other drills and activities that you do over and over and over to perfect your attributes, your speed, your timing, your precision, your power. And uh, that's what those drills are about. It's not about um, exact one-to-one -one play acting. Um, so anyway, I went off on a little rant, but that's a, that's a, a something to remember with those zero ground swedges. And you don't even need a zero ground swedge to get that kind of, uh, gouge I was talking about, but it certainly helps. That's the cold steel SRK survival rescue knife. Next up, this one I've had for quite a while. And, uh, I was I was with a, a a a former girlfriend at Lake George in New York when when this got its debut. Uh, she thought it was ridiculous, uh, really large for me to be carrying around, uh, and so I kept it in my backpack. But then when we got lost and then realized we had to walk all the way back to the car in the dark, which was pretty scary because we didn't really have a flashlight. I was prepared with my giant Bowie, but not with a flashlight. So uh, we made our way back. We could still see the, um, the, the blazes on the trees. So we were able to get back, uh, but it was kind of a harrowing trip. So I pulled this out and I carried this on my, uh, on my thigh, had it strapped to my leg like Rambo. And uh, we made it all the way back. Um, in the dark. I didn't use it for anything on that night, thankfully, uh, but I've used it a lot since. Um, on that night, we were paced by something. Uh, I don't know what it was, but there was something else walking kind of along with us. Uh, who knows? Uh, but at least, at least I had this with me making me feel secure. This also has the zero ground swedge. Uh, and since it's not coated with that black traction coating, it is considerably sharper than that SRK on the back edge. This knife I have thought many, many a time, despite all the other cool fighting knives I have, if I had to, you know, if I had to, uh, this would be an exceptional, exceptional knife to have uh, as a fighter. 
It's got that grippy, knurled, rubberized, I can't remember what that, Crayx, I can't remember what they call it, but it has that, that same sort of uh, rubbery textured handle. That coffin-shaped handle is awesome. And the rather thin profile of the Bowie itself is great. It's very facile in hand. Uh, you, you could fight to great effect with this knife. Um, even though it's more of an outdoorsy camp style survival knife, uh, if pressed, this would be an excellent one in that kind of situation. This was also made in the United States uh, with carbon V steel, or is that carbon five? Made a, uh, in the last century. <laughs> so a uh, great knife. And you can tell how old it is because it's got the leather sheath. Uh, yes, they put the thing on the wrong side, the retaining clip, even though it's ambidextrous. And and if it's on that side, it's it's all right. But I had to cover this with Gorilla Tape years ago uh, to stop it from cutting every time I moved it out of the sheath. Next up, and in a similar vein, uh, is the Laredo Bowie. I love this Bowie. This is a closet knife Bowie. So if I'm getting dressed and then uh, someone slaps me across the face with their glove and challenges me to a duel, uh, this is what I'll use. It's got the great leather sheath that you can't get anymore with that giant stud, which makes it so great for just slipping behind the belt. Um, great, great sheath. Nice full grain leather uh, stitched beautifully. But look at this blade, man. A fighter through and through. This is a perfect for that purpose. You've got a nearly 10 inch blade with, again, a, a, a zero ground swedge with a bit of a curve in it, giving it a, a hawk bill. Uh, you know, if you were to use it in reverse like this, not reverse grip, but if you're if you're to use it with that Randall fighting grip, which a lot of uh, Bowie fights have gone down this way uh, because of that hook shape, that that sort of hawkbill shape of the swedge. You can get nasty gouging, tearing cuts with this. This is great for that. Again, you got the coffin shaped handle. That's faux cocobolo, nice brass guard. And that is one of those cable tangs. So the tang comes to here, is soldered to a cable, which is uh, uh, threaded and, and, and then uh, bolted in there. Uh, at first, I thought the cable tang was a weak idea, but actually it's pretty darn good uh, for absorbing shock. Uh, if you receive any shock, it sort of uh, takes that up. Um, this I have not used in that rough outdoor uh, sense, batoning wood and such, but I've seen others do it and it survives just fine uh, with, with that cable tang. Look at that package. All right, next up is, this is a cool one uh, that my brother got me. It's the Chaos Kukri. All right, the Chaos series is Cold Steel's uh, knuckle dusting series. Uh, you know, two fingers there, two fingers there, and all pain right here. I believe that's cast aluminum, um, but actually I'm not sure now that I say so. Uh, it's got that old school uh, 1918 nut on the back for uh for changing people's minds and then right here look at that beautiful kukri blade that is just a wickedly shaped kukri i mean it is so extreme the way it uh the way it curves uh it, it just seems more extreme than other kukris to me um maybe maybe that's just me but uh yeah super super gnarly blade i'm not sure what i think this is sk sk5 blade steel uh, but i'm not sure you can correct me in the in the comments if you like uh i love the chaos series they make a dagger they make a bowie and um they make a tanto as well as this kukri uh so this is an intimidator i mean you know someone comes to the to the door trying to sell you a new roof and uh and you have to scare them off with this. But don't do that, obviously. But I mean, this is an intimidator. Look at it. It looks like a weapon off an ancient battlefield to me. So that is the Chaos Kukri. Highly recommended if you're up to no good. Uh, let's see. Next up. Oh, this is, a, they're all good. Uh, this is the 1917 Bowie. Look at this. This is a fighter through and through as well with that S-shaped guard and this really nice 
sort of cavalry style sheath. You've got the chape on the bottom, just in case you fall off your horse, that blade's not gonna come through the sheath, the leather sheath. Very nice sheath, by the way, with a, with a rotating uh, thing. <laughs> a dangle thing loop belt loop that's what it is uh but there it is in that beautiful blued blade and a handle boxy handle that i thought would be uncomfortable but is really quite quite nice uh, i find that with these indian made this is made by windless cutlery as are uh, a couple of other the large cold steel knives windless is known for making awesome knives uh, they are in india the one thing i don't like about them at least in their cold steel knives, is their whatever the finish is they put on the, the wood. Uh, so on this and also on the knife you're going to see next, I've taken alcohol and just rubbed it until all of the finish that comes off will come off, and then they're good to go. Uh, otherwise, I found that with sweat and stuff, your hand gets, well, gets stained. So uh, got rid of that. This has an interesting uh, tang sort of set up like an em uh, not an emerson like a randall where it's a slotted uh where there's a slot you know, let me if i come to the main camera i think it's easier to see uh, but you see that the tang is a full tang uh, but you can only see it on the bottom portion and there's a slot cut in that piece of wood in the handle and then it's slid up on top and then you have your screws uh, but not a full tang all the way up to the top full tang enough to be a full tang certainly but you don't see or feel the tang up there, which is fine by me. Uh, great, great move. This is a large blade, but it still moves around very nicely because of how it's weighted uh, more towards the handle. Also, they give you a choil here in case you have to do fine work. I'm not sure what you'd be doing with this, but uh, a very cool sheath as well. That is the 1917 Bowie. Next up, and uh, penultimate selection here. Yeah, I got a lot. And the tie pan should be among them. So if you don't know what that is, look it up. Classic, classic dagger from Cold Steel. But this is a classic Western style Bowie from Cold Steel. This is their Western Bowie. And uh, based on the Western W49 and uh, and other, other knives of that style, it's going to be a little bit thinner uh, at three sixteenths as opposed to a quarter inch. Most Bowies, like classic Bowies, are a qu quarter inch thick, but the Western style Bowies are always a little bit thinner, and uh, that might be to to aid in swinging and fighting and and that kind of thing. Uh, but that beautiful blade. Uh, some people I've found out do not like the shape of this blade. They like the Bowies that are more slender. Uh, this one widens out towards the tip. Uh, the apex of that belly right above the swedge, right? The break for the swedge, nice curved swedge and nice giant S shaped palm or guard there. And then you got the bird's beak down here and it just stays in, in the hand like nobody's business. I think that this one looks the most like a Bowie knife. You, you think Bowie knife, and this is what comes to mind to me with that, with that big guard and that, that widening blade. Uh, just, just a beauty, just a beauty. Uh, this was also one that I had to rub vigorously with alcohol to get rid of the, the kind of, kind of a ham fisted job done on the finishing of this knife, uh, in term, just the, the finish that they put on the handle. Um, I gotta say, but other than that, good to go. Great knife. Okay. Last in this cavalcade of amazing large cold steel knives is I'm going to have an avalanche of blades over here. It's the Natchez Bowie. <clears throat> my one regret, <clears throat> excuse me, my one regret is that I didn't get the earlier version when I had the chance with the leather sheath that's a lot like the Laredo. This is a Musso style Bowie and uh Musso was one of the people uh, that is credited possibly with making some of the early um, Bowie knives, uh, as well as uh, James Black from Arkansas. But uh, if you see, this is a 12-inch blade, a nice curve on the overall profile of the blade, a very sharp zero ground swedge. This is the sharpest of all of them that I've shown uh, 
And it's fitting because this is 100% a fighting knife, a fighting Bowie this is. This does also have that uh, cable tang. So the tang comes down to about here. And then there's a threaded cable. And then it's bolted back here. Uh, again, I have never heard any complaints with people who use this hard uh, batoning and all that. This is not a knife for that, but it, it does well because it's thick and it's wedge shaped in cross section. Uh, but yeah, really, this is for fighting and it's weighted that way. That pommel, that metal pommel here is that's there for a reason. The, the way it thickens out, that's there for a reason, not only to retain it in hand, but to add weight there so that the tip like a sword and like a saber moves around very, very easily. And that's the whole, that's the whole thing about a classic Bowie knife fighting style is that it's based on saber fighting. So you'll find a lot of Bowies are weighted towards the hand, uh, towards the pommel, so that that tip at the end of that very long blade moves around easily and can be indexed in a duel. So next time you're in a duel, you might consider the Natchez Bowie as it is a wicked, wicked fighting knife. All right. Thank you so much for joining me uh, on this collection video of Cold Steel Knives. I'm realizing I have done a number of them, but my collection keeps growing. And um, actually, the most recent edition isn't even here. <sighs> Breaks my heart, but I'll stop right there. Thanks for joining us again. Uh, be sure to join us on Sunday for Brian Montalvo of Keenison Knives. Man, we had a great conversation. What a cool guy. And those Keenison Knives are incredible. They're beautiful, beautiful knives. Join us for that conversation. Also, if you like the conversation that much, you can join us on Patreon because we talked for another half hour uh, and only Patreon uh, uh, members can hear that. Quickest way to do that is to scan the QR code on your screen or head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.